Well, let's, um, let's come to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we bless you, we glorify you, we thank you for all the ways in which you have blessed us today in our time together as families, in our moments together during our Christmas Eve services when it seemed indeed that the Holy Spirit had descended among us almost bodily. But we know, O oh God, that for many around our world today, this is a difficult time. This is a hard day. Some are recovering from tornadoes. Others are, are hiding from their oppressors. Some churches are worshiping undercover. And we know, O oh God, that again, this pandemic is wrapping itself around the world. And so in these times that are so difficult for so many, we just need Jesus. We need him in our hearts, in our minds, in our actions, and in our love for each other. We need Jesus. And so we pray, let that be so in our lives. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Have you ever um, experienced something that was so good that you turned to your husband or your wife and said, I can die happy now? Right? There was... Um, Years ago, there was a, a barbecue restaurant that started business not far from our house. It's called The Bearded Pig. And I love beef brisket. And when I put a bite of that in my mouth, it was so good that I said to myself and those seated with me, I can die. This is, I mean, this is so good. Have you ever said that about anything? About a concert, about, you know, seeing a sunrise or something so extraordinary. You just know it's not gonna get any better than that. And so this, uh, this little phrase has crept in to our popular expressions. But in fact, it starts here in Luke's gospel. And this is the part that we don't often read. It's after Jesus has been circumcised and he's presented as an infant in the temple for purification. And in fact, there's a song in here. It's one of the three songs of Christmas that are in our hymnal, in our liturgy, they're really important. The Song of Mary, the Song of Zechariah, and now the Song of Simeon. We don't normally associate these people, well, Mary perhaps, but Zechariah and Simeon, who are they? And why, are they, why do they show up in the Christmas story? To do some powerful teaching. In fact, inasmuch as this is really the end the finishing moments in the Christmas story, we need to pay really close attention because God speaks to us in the ending, closing stories of each episode of Jesus' life. 
So, here we go, starting with the 22nd verse, and I'm going to take it all the way um, to the 38th verse. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This right here tells us that his family was of humble means. They didn't have enough money for a lamb to be put on the altar or anything like that. This is sort of the minimum of what you can sacrifice. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been re revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms. Get a load of this. Some guy walks into the temple. And there must have been something in his eyes, something in his demeanor. They just hand him over to a stranger to hold him, to speak over him. Haley and I made a flight once to London, and uh, we had bulkhead seating, and we were so happy because I could stretch out my legs. And a woman sat down next to me with a two-year-old, gets better, with an inner ear infection all the way to London from Miami. So by the, by the time we got to Miami, the entire front row was passing the baby back and forth, just, pass, just giving this poor mother a break. And when we deplaned and we were getting ready to claim our luggage and go through customs, the mother said, can you take him for a moment? I've got to use the restroom. Now, ima imagine handing your little boy to complete strangers and just say, take care of him for a second. I'll, I'll be back in a moment. You know, I think perhaps the Holy Family had been through such experiences at the birth of Jesus, the visitation by the, sh good, the shepherds. Um, so much had happened that they were just open to whatever God was going to do. And here's what God did. Simeon took him in his arms <clears throat> and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. Which means, in very poetic language, I can die now because I have seen the Lord's Messiah. That was the promise. You'll live until you see the Messiah. So he's happy to let go of his life. But not before he says this. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light, listen, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people, Israel. I'll get back to these words, because I think these are incredibly significant. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined 
for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and will be a sign that will be opposed. So the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. So interesting in this story of Jesus' birth, so many elderly people show up and have important things to say and do. We sometimes forget this, that God chooses the elderly to preside over the birth of Jesus and play a critical role. So, then as a widow to the age of 84, 84 years old, 84, oh my gosh, the average lifespan back then was 35. So, she'd been on Medicare for a long time. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of God. So why is this so, 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 so important? Well, I think the key words here are in Simeon's song. I mean, first he says, I can die now because I finally have seen what I've been waiting to see for my whole life, just about. But this is how he characterizes what he has seen. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel important thing here is a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Years ago, when I was living in Atlanta and working in the restaurant industry and fairly miserable and not having a good time working in fast food, um, I had done my senior thesis in college on Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk who was a poet and an amazing person for God's justice. I mean, even though he lived in a community where nobody spoke, they were silent. But he wrote, oh my goodness, he wrote. So in, I would go to the Trappist Monastery in Conyers, Georgia, just outside of town, and spend the weekends there. And at evening service, they would sing this song. And in their hymnal, it started out, Lumen ad revelationem gentium. And I remember that every evening in the shadows for Vespers. They would sing about a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And the reason it's so important is because this is us. This is us in this story. And Luke is insistent from the very beginning of Jesus' story that he is pointing this blessing, this Messiah, outwards from the community of Israel. And this this wave of love and compassion and mercy will go to all the world. And it's true, it has. That's what's happened. However, what we need to understand is that this this is very, very old. This prophecy goes all the way back to Abraham. When Abraham was called by God to be the father of Israel, God said, I'm going to bless your people. Well, listen to this. This is right after 
An angel prevented him from sacrificing Isaac and said, you're the real deal. You went all the way with God's demands, so we know, I know, that your heart is good. And here's what's going to happen. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And by your offspring shall, listen, by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves because you have obeyed my voice. So we call the Jews the chosen people. And it's clear God chose them. But what we sometimes fail to understand and what they sometimes fail to understand is that they, the reason they were chosen was to perform a mission on earth. They had the biggest project that God could give to any nation, and that was the blessing of the entire planet. After everything had gone haywire between, from all the way from the Garden of Eden to the Tower of Babel, everything was messed up. God reset several times. It still didn't work, and so the camera zooms in on Abraham, and he says, starting right now, you are the father of this nation that will bless all nations. And my friends, that's what Simeon is talking about. He's talking about this moment when all the history of God's people from Abraham on has led to this moment when Messiah is born and turns us into a blessing, we become, in effect, honorary Jews because we inherit their mission, which is to tell the world about God's love. And I want to share with you today that where Luke ends this story is with this mission. Very often we don't understand that the birth narrative is about the passing of a baton to a young man who would become the Messiah, or is the Messiah, but would fully come in to his powers after his baptism, his public ministry, and then he would pass that baton over to us. And it's called the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So, my friends, you are honorary Jews. And you have a special purpose. And I'm not kidding you. You are here to save humanity from its stupidity its sinfulness, its stubbornness, and its hatefulness. You, each of us, that's the ministry of the church, to proclaim the good news so clearly and to express the love of Jesus so practically and tangibly that the world simply can't forget it. So look, um, we can talk about this in any number of ways, but in fact, the purpose of our life is to have the very mind of Christ, to take up his way of relating to people and bringing it into our own selves. That's what it means to grow in Christian discipleship. That's why we read the Bible, why we go to church, why you have to listen to me preach, I'm so sorry, but it's, 
God's going to do even this to you to help you get it right. So this is Paul writing to the Philippians. And this is what Christians are to do. This is not extra points. This is not, um, this is not sainthood. It's just what one of my favorite Christian writers, Watchman Nee, said in one of his greatest books, The Normal Christian Life. This is just basic behavior. Paul says in the second chapter of Philippians, if then there is, is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete Be of the same mind, having the same love. Be in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. This is an extraordinary lesson, and it's not an uncommon lesson. This is how God is going to change the world. In the letter to the Romans, Paul again characterizes what it means to be a Christian with these words. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be claim, claim to be wiser than yourself. Do not repay anyone evil with evil. And he goes on. Okay? Jesus says in John's gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. My friends... This is how he is the way, all right? And this is how we are to be. And what we do when we celebrate the birth of this child is we celebrate the birth of these qualities within us. We celebrate the birth of these qualities and ways of carrying ourselves forward in the world. These are ours. This is how we do it. Doesn't matter whether you're retired, whether you're a teacher, a CEO, a mail carrier, whatever. This is it. And if we are to be the light of God to the world, this is the only way. Please listen. This is the only way the world will be redeemed if we do these things. Now, there is a hard edge to this. You know, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble, in other words. If we find ourselves in constant anger with each other or the world, if we find ourselves just simmering and seething at our neighbor, if we find ourselves being dismissive, if we find ourselves just being rude to the person who waits on our table, if we find ourselves, you know, putting those Facebook pages out about how stupid the opposition is, the people that we don't agree with politically, if we find ourselves falling into that, You and I are off course. And there's no other explanation for it. We have departed from the way and the truth. 
and we are endangering our life. That's the tough side of this. It is incredibly ambitious, but here is, and my friends, this is the truth. Sometimes we think the world changes because of technological development. Sometimes we think the world changes because of the titans of industry that bring these things forward. Sometimes we think that the world changes because empires conquer other people and assimilate them into their culture. Sometimes we think the world changes by force of arms. Sometimes we think the world changes because we're the best. We are the exceptional ones. That is not the case. No war has ever been fought that caused all war to stop forever. Remember, they thought that with the First World War. It was the war to end all wars. There are no wars that will end wars. They'll just start other wars. The way we bring about the kingdom of God is through tremendous humility, devotion to the way of Jesus, and his lordship. We can't do this on our own. The whole point of him being resurrected is so that he can be our living Lord, our director in the field, as it were. And all that is in his birth story, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, to everybody else. That's our mission today. And it is a wonderful way to live far better than any that I know of. I said it on Christmas Eve. Sometimes we have this attitude that we will not suffer fools gladly, but really it should be the attitude that Jesus suffered gladly for our foolishness. And that's the truth. Let's pray, shall we? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for the song of Simeon. Thank you for the praises of Anna. Thank you for these, these senior, senior citizens that gather around him at his birth and speak the truth. They tell it like it is. Father, help us to just tell it like it is, to bless people, to help them, to express and give love, compassion, extend ourselves toward them, to visit the sick, those in prison, those who are naked. As Jesus said, all these people that we meet that are in dire need, as much as we do it to them, we do it to you, O Lord. Father, thank you for Christmas, and thank you for the meaning of Christmas that we found right here. Amen and amen.